do you like to check out you like to check out our upcoming and past talks they can be found at rlforum.stanford.edu and you can also follow us on twitter at twitter.com slash rlforumstanford and follow us there for talk updates um, next week we'll actually be holding our first hybrid talk uh, which will take place in packard 101 and on zoom uh, with ian osband of DeepMind. Uh, who will be talking about his work on epistemic neural networks. And uh, likely these RL forum events won't be running during the summer, but we'll keep everyone posted about the events planned for autumn. Okay, so on to today's speaker. Um, Vincent is a Dean's Chair Associate Professor in the Departments of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Mathematics at the National University of Singapore. He received his PhD in EECS at MIT in 2011, and he conducts research in information theory, machine learning, and statistical signal processing. Now, I do have one personal anecdote involving Vincent. So maybe like four hours after I posted my first archive paper with Ben, uh, I get this email telling me about like two bugs that are in my proof. Um, and the sender was none other than Vincent. And so from what I can tell, he's a very sharp and passionate researcher. So curious to see what he'll share with us today. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome our speaker. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, I, I do check out. By the way, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, by the way, I, I do check out papers that uh, are of interest to me every day. Uh, and uh, I like to check some of the math. So. Uh, today, I would like to uh, talk about uh, a topic known as uh, optimal clustering with bandit feedback. And thanks very much for the kind introduction and the invitation to speak. Um, this is joint work with my students, uh, Jin Wen and uh, Zi Xing, uh, who are both uh, students at the National University of Singapore. Okay, so um, this will be the rough outline of the talk. Uh, I will motivate the problem and then set it up precisely. <laughs> Now, in order to design a policy, one needs to understand and analyze something known as the lower bound, because the lower bound gives us insights into what the optimal strategy is, as with all bandit problems. Then we will introduce our algorithm, which we call bandit online clustering, and I will show you some numerical experiments. So the outline is very much standard, right? But there are some ingredients in here that may be of independent interest, okay? Right, the, as we know, what we are going to do is clustering. Right? And in clustering, there are algorithms that are very well known, such as k-means. But k-means lacks uh, theoretical guarantees uh, in the sense that it may not be able to converge or may not be able to bring us to the global optimum. So how can we overcome such problems? Uh, that will be the content of the of, of this part of the talk where we talk about an algorithm that in fact can give us some uh, global guarantees. All right, so that's the interesting part. All right, so now let us motivate the problem. So um, a central uh, problem in machine learning is the task of partitioning a set of items into smaller clusters that share similar characteristics. And across the clusters, you know, they share different characteristics. And there are numerous algorithms proposed, such as k-beans and spectral clustering. <laughs> However, there are several challenges as well, okay, including uh, measurement noise and the fact that uh, our data sets are becoming increasingly larger. Right? So in fact, uh, the data sets that we collect are collected sometimes in a sequential fashion, right? which means that you have um, data points coming in and you want to cluster them and you want to say something about them without having to do recomputations, all right? So you can imagine that you have more and more customers that come into your shop and you need to somehow uh, say that the next customer that comes in is of a certain type, type A or type B and type C and so on and so forth, all right? So we are interested in the in a certain online variant of the classical offline clustering problem. But the twist here is that the feedback that we get, the information that we get is of the form of bandit feedback. And I will try to make this precise in a, in a short while. But roughly speaking, at each point in time, 
the agent only observes a noisy measurement of the selected item or the selected arm. Okay, it does not uh, observe anything from the arms that it did not choose. So we are going to pull arms adaptively so as to minimize the expected number of total arm pulls. So this is uh, analog, analogous to a so-called best arm identification problem. So we want to minimize the total number of uh, items chosen or arms pulled to correctly partition the given arm set with high probability. Okay. So here, here is a pictorial representation of what I just said. So the customer feedback on certain products are collected in an online manner and always accompanied by random or systematic noise. So here we have uh, six groups of customers, all right? So group A, group B, group C, and so on and so forth. And at every point in time, say at time one, we are going to query group two and we get some noisy feedback from it, all right? We're going to get some noisy feedback from it. So this is uh, the feedback that we get. At the group, at the time two, we are going to query group six and we, want, we will get some noisy feedback, a random variable. We're going to get some noisy feedback from it. And we're going to do this uh, for some time. And at every point in time, the choice that we make depends on the choices that we made previously, as well as the random variables or the bandit feedback that we obtained previously. At a certain time, we feel sufficiently confident. And what is our job? Our job is to say that, oh, gee, this guy here, or this group here, and this group here, let me make this clearer, all right? These three groups, these three subgroups actually form, actually have similar characteristics, okay? This group has uh, similar characteristics, characteristics only with itself. And these two groups have similar characteristics. Now, the way I've arranged it uh, is such that the groups that, are, that have similar characteristics are contiguous, but it doesn't have to be that way. So we want to learn the clustering at the end of the day. And we want the probability that we succeed to be, say, 99% or larger. Okay? So uh, hopefully the task is clear, but we will still try to make this, we will try to make this more precise by using some math. Okay, so we want to partition six subgroups here into three market segments using bandit feedback. Okay, so let us try to make this more precise. Okay, so we have a certain arm set. Those are the number of subgroups that I talked about uh, two slides ago. So those, those would be the, the groups one to six. So the total number of arms is denoted as M because we need to reserve the symbol K for the total number of clusters that we know in advance. So K is the number of clusters that we know in advance, all right? So that's what we wanna do. We want to partition these uh, M items. There's a very classical machine learning problem. We want to partition these M items into K disjoint, clus uh, disjoint clusters. And in the same cluster, the arms have the same distribution, all right? And how do we model this? Well, the arms share the same D-dimensional mean vector. All right, uh, an instance of a cluster bandits problem can be characterized fully by two objects, these two objects, all right? This C here consists of the cluster indices of the arms, and U represents the K centers of the clusters. All right, so this is a bit, uh, this can get a little bit confusing, so let me illustrate this. So suppose we have K equals to two and M equals to six. What is our C vector? Our C vector could look as follows. So the first two items belong to cluster one and the last, two I the last four items belong to cluster two, okay? So that is an instance of my C. So it basically encodes the cluster indices, all right? So the last four items are similar. The first two items are similar. And U vector, the U vector basically is a vector of uh, two vectors. It's a, it's a matrix of two vectors mu1 and mu2. So these are, this represents the, the mean of these arms and this represents the mean vector of these arms. So each one of these vectors is, uh, is d-dimensional and we have k of them because we have k clusters. Hopefully this is clear. All right. Okay, so we consider partitioning the instances. So this is some regularity condition. We cannot have that the mean vectors be the same. So the mean vectors must be distinct, all right? So 
otherwise uh, something is degenerate. So basically, we have a cluster bandits problem. Of course, we do not know this, and we want to learn C, all right? But uh, the C is encoded in this particular way, all right? And we basically have a, a, a bunch of K mean vectors, all right, that we also do not know, but that they are distinct. Okay, so here are the cluster indices of the M arms, all right? So each one of these numbers here, each one of these Cs here, is basically a number between one to K because we have K clusters. And uh, right, so the K clusters of the sensors I've already mentioned. At each point in time, the agent selects an arm AT from the arm set A. So AT is a number between one to M, right? And then observes a noisy measurement of the mean vector of AT. So XT is equal to mu of that particular index plus eta t. Eta t is some Gaussian noise with standard, uh, uh, with, with zero mean and uh, identity covariance matrix. All right, so this is a little confusing, all right, I understand. So suppose we chose in that particular, in, in that particular bandit instance, all right, in the particular cluster bandit instance, we have this mean vector, oh, sorry, we have this uh, uh, cluster, set of cluster indices. And at, it, at time t, our algorithm chose, for example, uh, arm three, okay, arm three. So what is uh, CAT? All right, CAT is two, because we are, we, we are going to choose this particular index here, right? So the third arm is in the second cluster. Then what do we observe? We observe a certain random variable XT, which corresponds to mu of two, the second cluster index, all right? plus noise. So that is the mechanism. Hopefully that's clear, okay? So this is illustrated on the next slide as well, all right? So for example, if, uh, so here's my cluster band, here's my uh, cluster bandit instance. I have three clusters and they are encoded in different colors, green, red, and blue, okay? And the first four items are in the same cluster. The second two items are in the second cluster and so on and so forth. So at time, at a certain time, I pick arm two. Then what I would observe is this random variable, okay? Mu of C2, okay? And C2, so C2 is exactly equal to one, mu of one plus noise. Now the algorithm decided to choose arm eight at time two, two at time t plus one, all right? Arm eight at time t plus one. Then we will ask, gee, what is the um, cluster index of arm eight? Well, the cluster index of arm eight is three. So what I would observe is mu three plus noise, All right? So it's xt plus one, okay? So hopefully the setting is clear. So you can think of this as like an online version of Gaussian mixture models, All right? We have um, a bunch of uh, means that we do not know. The covariances we do know, they are all identity. And maybe I will say a few words about how we handle non-identity covariance matrices if I have time. But, uh, the mean vectors are all different. So it's like Gaussian mixture models, but you're going to sample the points in an online fashion, depending on your algorithm. And we'll design an algorithm to do this optimally. Right. So there are some equivalences between partitions and instances. Okay. The representation of a partition or an instance is not unique. Obviously, if uh, the underlying uh, cluster index, index uh, vector is this, and what we learn is two, two, one, 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 one. Well, then we can declare victory, all right? Because the, we have basically learned the correct partition, okay? The exact numbering does not really matter. Okay, so this is okay. This is correct. So we want to make this formal, all right? So we need to talk about equivalences. So we can basically define uh, for a permutation, sigma on K, we can define sigma C to be basically the uh, application of sigma to each one of the cluster indices and sigma U to be the application of the permutation to each one of the means. Roughly speaking, what, I'm, what I just said is that given a particular true cluster index vector, all right, we basically can permute them and still declare victory if we uh, permute the indices, okay? So for two partitions C and C prime, if there exists a permutation sigma, 
such that C equals to sigma C prime, then we write this, all right? So basically we can partition the, the set of cluster indices, the vector of cluster indices into equivalence classes, but we're not going to be so formal in this talk, okay? So for two instances, C and U and C prime and U prime, if mu of CM equals to mu prime of CM for all M, all right, then we can write the following equivalence as well. All right, but this is a bit too formal to understand. All that we need to know is that when we try to learn the cluster indices, we don't really have to learn the exact numberings. Okay, we just want to learn the correct partition. Okay, so now let me try to make things more formal about what we want to do. All right, what is an online algorithm? Now we are going to operate in the so-called fixed confidence setting. There's another setting known as a fixed budget setting where you are given a fixed horizon of say maybe 1,000 rounds and you try to do as best as you can in the 1,000 rounds. But in the fixed confidence setting, what we are going to fix is the error probability or the confidence level, delta. I say error probability because I'm an information theorist. And the agent uses an online algorithm pi to do a few things. All right, the online algorithm consists of a arm pooling strategy or sampling rule that decides which arm to pull at each time step. All right, at each possible time step, you need to decide which arm to query. And you need to also decide when to stop based on the prescribed error probability delta. Okay, so that is a stopping time and the stopping rule. And after you stop, you need to output a correct part, uh, what you think is a correct partition, which we call C out, okay? Hopefully the C out is uh, equivalent to the underlying uh, partition C, and you want to do this with high probability, okay? So that's the recommendation rule. So a, and a particular algorithm has three rules, the sampling, stopping, and recommendation rules. We want to do this in the smallest expected number of time steps. So the performance metric is standard. We want to minimize over all possible algorithms, the expected stopping time, subject to the delta pack condition. The delta pack condition is nothing but the condition that the probability that uh, we make a mistake in the sense of outputting the incorrect and incorrect partition is upper bounded by delta. All right, so that's, that's as simple as it is. Hopefully everything is clear. And perhaps now is a good point to ask if anything is unclear. Okay, so there are some other small little notations that uh, I'm not sure how important they are, but uh, let me just run through them very quickly. All right, so this is the probability simplex and the open probability simplex on n elements. This is the Hamming distance. We will need the Hamming distance between two partitions. The Hamming distance is the number of uh, locations in which uh, uh, two vectors differ. This is the, right, the standard binary relative entropy, okay? And when we say argmin, right, you will have to use the notion of argmin uh, quite often, right? Argmin is imprecise. The argmin refers to the smallest, uh, the minimum index in the set of all elements that achieve the argmin, all right? So these are just some small notations that we will use uh, later on. Okay, so as promised, we will have to talk about the lower bound before we talk about interesting things such as the algorithm. The lower bound idea, of course, every lower bound that I know of, the key idea comes from change of measure and change of measure comes from a churn off, all right? Change of measure type ideas have been used to derive lower bounds in uh, best arm identification problem, pure uh, regret minimization problem in bandits, as well as in other problems in information theory, such as <clears throat> lower bounds on error exponents, all right? So this technique is prevalent everywhere, not just in bandits, okay? So what we will use, so for example, this is a very common inequality known as the high probability Pinsker's inequality. Okay, but I'm not gonna to talk too much about this. So a, a particular piece of notation that will be useful for us is the notion of an alternative instance set. Okay, this is uh, this, this notation here and this the notion of an alternative instance set goes back to the work of Kaufman. So this is a set of all possible instances of uh, cluster indices as well as means such that the cluster indices, okay, are not the same as the original one, okay? 
So the set of alternative instances where C is not a correct partition, and this is made formal by, by these equivalences here. But roughly speaking, this is the set of alternative instances where C is not the correct partition. Okay, so we're just making things formal in mathematics here. All right, so this is the first result, which is the lower bound. For every fixed confidence level delta and instance CU, any delta pack of online clustering algorithm must satisfy the following lower bound on the error on the stopping time. Okay, so this is the relative entropy or the KL divergence between delta and one minus delta, Bernoulli distributions, and this is the hardness parameter of interest. Okay, so the hardness parameter consists of two parts, a maximization and a minimization. The maximization is over a proportion of ampoules. You can think of this as proportion of ampoules uh, of the ampoules over the M amps, of, so over M amps, okay? And this minimization is over worst case instances, worst case. All right, because we are looking at the minimum over all possible alternative strategy, all alternative instances, such that the cluster index C prime is not the same as that as C. Okay, and this quadratic term here comes about because we are assuming Gaussians. All right, so this is a this is a very natural uh, hardness parameter, and a lower bound is not actually our our main contribution, but the lower bound tells us something about the optimal strategy to do things. Okay, if we rearrange this a little and take limits as delta goes to zero, we get this uh, lower bound, very neat lower bound. Okay, so this is what we call the hardness parameter. The harder, the, the larger this is, okay, the larger D is, then the longer it takes to succeed. Okay, so that's why we call this the hardness parameter. Okay, so there's the hardness parameter for you again, right? And uh, let, me, let me just uh, comment on this, uh, which I've already done so. So any lambda in, uh, in this probability simplex on M, right, represents the proportion of ampoules. So PM, let me recall, is the, is the uh, probability simplex on M amps, okay? And we wish to find the optimal proportion of ampoules, lambda, to distinguish instance C from the most confusing alternative instance, which is captured in alt C. All right, so we wish to combat the alternative instance that is the most confusing in terms of the distance, in terms of this particular distance, okay? So with the knowledge of the instance CU, the optimization problem naturally reveals the optimal sampling rule. And this is the basic idea behind the design of our sampling rule. We want to get a handle on this. But of course, in order to get a handle on this, we have several unknowns. We do not know what are the underlying uh, mu's, the underlying means. Of course, we do not know the underlying C as well. So how do we get around all these problems that we do not know what the optimization problem is? If we, if we knew the optimization problem, we could solve this in principle and we could figure out what is the optimal proportion of arm pools and we could just pull according to lambda. But we do not know any of this here. So we have to try to combat our, uh, our uh, no knowledge, right? So we're going to give these two optimization problems names, okay? The optimization problem that is the inverse of the hardness parameter, we're going to call it the sub-inf problem. And the problem, uh, the inner problem, we're going to call it the inner infimum problem, all right? So this is easier to remember. All right, can these be solved tractably? If they can be solved tractably, there is some hope of solving them tractably in an online fashion to give us some idea as to how to pull our arms, all right? The optimization problems in their raw and original form appear to be intractable. Why? The, in particular, the definition of alt C is combinatorial, okay, in nature. And the number of instances there is obviously very large, right? In particular, for a fixed number of clusters K, the total number of partitions is also quite large, all right? The total number of partitions grows as the sterling number of the second kind. So if we're going to search over this, right, at each point in time, it's not going to be tractable. So we want to come up with some new scheme that uh, gets around these sort of uh, problems. Okay, but let's examine the optimization problems in some detail. Let's look at the inner infimum problem. Okay, this is the inner infimum problem. What do you think we can say about this? What do you think we can say about this? We are looking for the instance 
that is not the same as the original partition that minimizes some distance. We want to say something smart, interesting. And the first thing we can observe, which is very intuitive but may not be so easy to prove, is that the inner infimum problem can be restricted to those alternative instances such that their cluster index differs, cluster index vector differs from the true one by Hamming distance exactly one. All right. So if this is my true cluster, if this is my true cluster vector, clustering vector, then I only need to consider those um, cluster vectors, cluster index vectors that differ from uh, the original one by, uh, by Hamming distance one. For example, this one. Okay, so that it only differs by Hamming distance one. Okay, right, so good. This is very intuitive, but it still requires a proof. So instead of considering all possible alternative instances in odd C, this particular lemma shows that it suffices to consider instances who part whose partitions have a Hamming distance of exactly one from the given partition C. So the sketch of the proof is, I'm not gonna go through this. You take any partition and instance, okay, C dagger, mu, U dagger, and you construct successively instances with smaller Hamming distance until you reach one, okay? So that is the rough outline, okay? So once we have this, and this is getting a little bit hairy and technical, once we have this uh, property, we can now focus on this particular optimization problem and simplify it. And in fact, once we have this, all right, then we can actually simplify the inner infimum problem into a simple problem that involves just the, the, just the, mu, just the mean vectors here, as well as some weights, as well as some weights. So the inner infimum here becomes a finite minimization problem. Okay, instead of minimizing over many elements here, instead of minimizing over over C prime and U in the alternative set, we are just going to minimize over pairs of, in, pairs of clusters, cluster indices, okay? So that, that is the punchline here. The inner infimum now reduces to a finite minimization problem. Now, what about the value of the inner infimum? Okay, the value of the inner infimum can be characterized by this particular function here, G of lambda U, all right? This is what we will, this we will, this is what we will optimize over for the optimal uh, proportion of arm pools. So we have to, basically what we have to assert in order to um, prove that our stopping rule is uh, asymptotically optimal is that this inner infimum, the value of this inner infimum is continuous, all right? So I'm not gonna go through what we really mean by uh, continuous, all right, here, but we have to show that this particular function here is continuous on, um, the probability simplex and the set of mean vectors, okay? This allows us to assert optimality. So the solution, we call that the solution to the maximum min, max min problem is the following. And so one, so combining the previous two results, we can see that uh, this hardness parameter can be simplified as, the, as this problem here. I mentioned that we can, we can simplify the inner infimum into a finite minimization or maximization problem. And we basically can uh, simplify the outer supremum into a simpler problem on a smaller probability simplex. Initially, this was a supremum over all possible proportion of arm pools on M arms. And this represents uh, a smaller optimization problem on K clusters, okay? K is smaller than M. So basically, in this part of the work, what we are doing is we are trying to analyze the properties of the lower bound in order to make some progress, okay? We want to get around the problem of too many alternative instances here. And we managed to get around that. We want to try to understand the purpose, the, the meaning of the supremum here. We don't have to take the supremum over all possible arms, all right? Equivalently, we can take the minimum or say maximum in the inverse case over over proportions of the clusters. And there are only K clusters, much less than M arms. Okay. So here, what we are trying to say is that there is a certain bijection between optimal proportion of arm pools and the weights that we assign to each one of the clusters. 
Okay, so that is rather intuitive because every element inside each cluster, every arm inside each cluster has the same distribution. So the way we treat each one of them should be the same, should be symmetric. Okay, so there are some other properties here that I'm, I'm probably not going to talk too much about, but we need to establish some other continuity properties of, uh, of the value of the, this sort of uh, optimization problem in order for us to assert optimality. Okay, and this is a little bit tricky because as you can see here, we are looking at a certain argmax. So we are very careful here to be precise about what we mean by argmax. This is a correspondence because there could be many elements that attain the argmax. So in order for us to do this, in order for us to say something about the correspondence, we need to first assert that it's single valued and it has some continuity property. All right, then we can say that in fact, this is a function and it, has, it is a continuous function. All right, so this guarantees computational efficiency and asymptotically, asymptotic optimality of our sampling group. So all in all here, and these are all the mathematical properties of the hardness parameter, all in all, we have some nice continuity properties and there is a way to simplify them to give us insight about the proportion of arm pools. Okay, so this summarizes the properties that I talked about. So in particular, the inner infimum here can be summarized as into a finite minimization problem and the maximum minimum here, the sub if problem can be uh, converted into a finite convex minimax problem in which there are nice ways to deal with it. So the inner infimum problem plays an essential role in the computation of the stopping rule. The max bin problem guarantees the computational efficiency of our sampling rule. Okay, so that brings me to the algorithmic part of the talk, which is probably more interesting. Okay, so I'll go at each step. Although we aim at producing a correct partition in the final recommendation rule, so we somehow need to guess in an online fashion what the mean vectors are, mu1 to mu k. So we want to get some estimates of them and we need to learn this on the fly, all right? So given some past measurements of the arm set, how do we produce an estimate of, well, what we really want, the what we really want is the partition vector and some, and some estimate of the mean vector, mean vectors all captured in this matrix U, okay? So that's what we need to do on the fly. Okay, so given all the past, say, say that we are at a certain point in our algorithm and we have already put these arms and obtained these uh, observations, all right? A1, X1, all the way to AT, XT. Using the Gaussianity of the problem, all right? The log likelihood function that the instance is C prime U prime can be written down in closed form very nicely in terms of a quadratic, no problem, okay? So that is the log likelihood function. So for any arm M, let NMT and mu MT, mu hat MT, denote the number of pools and the empirical estimates up to time T respectively. Then it is not too difficult to find out what is the maximum likelihood of the unknown pair CU, all right? So we can just do the minimization of this problem here, all right? So this involves a weighted sum of squared distances between the empirical estimate of each arm and its associated center. Now, anyone who has taken standard machine learning would uh, immediately, your eyes will immediately light up. Why? Because if you do not have this term here, all right, if this term say is uniform, then this is nothing but the cost function in k-means. It's the sum of squares, all right? So this, is not, this looks like the cost function in k-means, which means that we need some version of k-means as a subroutine to solve our problem. So this is the, with, this, with these weights here, this is the so-called weighted k-means problem. And we need some way of dealing with this, okay? So the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimate, use the classical offline weighted k-means clustering problem as a subroutine that we need to deal with. So any algorithm that is suitable for the standard k-means problem or the weighted k-means problem is applicable to obtain an approximate solution of the MLE, okay? However, there is a big problem. There are no theoretical guarantees for finding a global minimum of this weighted k-means problem in general, okay? What we are going to use is some very old result known as weighted k-means with maximum initialization. All right, and this is something that I'm going to briefly talk about. 
Okay. So what do we do? The initialization is important. And with suitable initialization, we can say something with theoretical guarantees. So we have the inputs as usual, the number of clusters we need to know. We have certain empirical estimates at this point in time, and we have weights assigned to each uh, arm. So the number of times we have put each arm, that's the history of the problem. We have that, okay? So what we are going to do is, so you have some arms here, some uh, empirical estimates of the means of each arm. We are going to arbitrarily set this to be mu hat one. Just say that this is mu hat one, all right? So what we are going to do is we are going to choose K centers, all right? We're going to choose K centers. How are we going to choose them? The demonstration is right here. We're going to arbitrarily choose mu one to be anything, all right? And now we're going to look for which guy is the furthest. And I artificially inserted this point because it's the furthest. We're going to call it mu two, mu hat two, all right? Now we're going to look for the mu that is the furthest from these two arms, that has the furthest distance from the arms that we have already chosen. Uh, I don't know which one is the furthest. Let, let, let me artificially create this. Okay, this is the furthest. All right, mu hat three and so on and so forth until we have reached the total number of clusters. So this is called max semin initialization. We are choosing the furthest point, okay, to initialize, right? So after we have done that, we are just going to run k-means or weighted k-means, all right? We're going to assign each arm to its weight, uh, closest cluster, and then we are just going to recompute the means, recompute the means, all right? So uh, assign each arm to its closest center. This is basically the assignment step or the um, M step in EM, and this is basically the E step in EM, if you wish, okay? So that is it. And so we have to play a certain initialization trick, and that allows us to say something uh, with theoretical guarantees. So how about a stopping rule? That was the sampling rule, all right? How about a stopping rule? As the sampling, M sampling proceeds, the algorithm is to determine when to stop the sampling, when to stop, and that to stop, we, we denote that by tau delta, and then to recommend a certain partition with error probability at most delta. So most algorithms out there for best arm identification, all right, make use of something known as the generalized likelihood ratio. So you write down the likelihood, okay, the likelihood of a certain instance over the worst case alternative instance. But we'll see that there are problems with this, all right? So all works use the generalized likelihood ratio. However, the generalized likelihood ratio strategy is computationally intractable for our problem. Why? Okay, currently we have a certain maximum likelihood of the partition as well as a set of means encoded in this particular matrix, mu t star. That's the maximum likelihood. How does the GLR generalized likelihood ratio or, the, or its log version look like? Well, you can write it down and we have, to, we have to tackle this minimization problem here. This minimization represents which is the, which is the uh, instance that competes best with C t star mu t star, which is the current MLE, all right? So we have to solve this problem at each point in time if we adopt the GLR. The first big problem is that it requires the global optimizer in the log GLR statistic, okay? The global optimizer. And it is difficult to find, all right? And you may have recalled that a similar Hamming that we, we may, have, may be able to search over instances that have Hamming distance one. All right, you may have recalled from the con converse. Okay, what is converse? It's called, um, information theory. So the lower bound part, all right, that we may, we may only have to search over instances with Hamming distance one, but that's not true in general because there's a certain mismatch, all right? There's a certain mismatch between, sorry, between CT star as well as uh, this, all right? If these two were the same, we are in business, all right? But these two are different in general. Okay, there's a mismatch because mu cm is replaced by its empirical version only. So there's a problem, right? There's a mismatch. So in order to get around this, our remedy is um, to let ct minus one, mu t, ut minus one be the estimate of the true pair based on the initialized, based on the k means with maximum initialization 
up to time t minus one. All right. So there are, there's a combinatorial problem here that in, in which we have to search for the exact global minimizer, which is difficult. So we are going to remedy this. Okay. How do we remedy this? We are going to consider two different statistics up to this point in time that will allow us to remedy the mismatch. Okay, so these expressions here, there's no need to rec remember this, but we are going to artificially engineer our stopping rule based on these new statistics so that there is no more mismatch between the means as well as this, as well as the, the set of alternative instances. Okay, now once we do this and we redesign our stopping criterion, there is no more mismatch here. And the problem is completely analogous to the inner infimum problem that I talked about in the, con in the converse of the lower bound. Okay, then we can make use of the Hamming distance one property to try to solve this problem. But of course, we need to take into account, we, there's some analysis to do here when we replace, when we replace the maximum likelihood estimate what, with what we have at this point in time, which is this partition that is output by the K means initialization, K means with clever initialization. Okay, so, right, the stopping time is standard. We basically look at our statistic and we compare that to a certain threshold. And the threshold uh, can be designed in a way that is similar to works by Kaufman and Kulin, recent works. What we can show is that the stopping time satisfies the delta error probability, satisfies that it has error probability and most delta. And so there is a whole algorithm. There is no need to read through this because I've already described the, the elements of the algorithm. So here we do k-means uh, initialization. We figure out the optimal proportion of ampoules, okay? And we pull according to the proportion of ampoules roughly, okay? And then when do we stop? We compute these two statistics. And these two statistics are now going to allow us to circumvent the difficult optimization problem. And we form this global statistic here. If this global statistic here exceeds a certain threshold, stop. And declare your current guess of the, of the uh, vector of cluster indices to be your output. That's it. So the, the punchline here is that we have to overcome several obstacles. All right, the overall strategy is rather similar to best arm identification in the detracting strategy of uh, Garivi and Kaufman or track and stop. But there are several other things that we have to take care of. For example, the number of partitions is combinatorially large. For example, the maximum likelihood estimate does not really work, okay? For example, um, we, we have to overcome the problem of the, um, the mismatch here. And so we have to design this other statistic, which we call Z2, so that uh, this term here corresponds to this term here. And we can make use of the fact that the closest alternative instance has Hamming distance one, all right? Then life becomes easier, okay? All right, so given everything that I've said up to this point, all right, we have a certain algorithm which we uh, are not very creative in calling, in, in, in uh, giving it a name. So we just call it bandit online clustering. And it has certain theoretical properties. In particular, we can show that uh, it's stop, expected stopping time uh, divided by log of one over delta. You take the lim soup, you recover the hardness parameter. So we have come up with an efficient algorithm that you can actually program quite easily in Python such that it is asymptotically optimal. You know, I was an information theorist and this is very appealing to me because information theorists like to nail down a number and we have nailed down a number that characterizes the difficulty of the problem. But if you know information theory, in information theory, we can do anything we want, right? We don't have to worry about computational considerations. The good thing here is that we have an efficient algorithm that can achieve this number, the hardness number, all right? There is no O notation and no implied constants, anything like that. All right, so I've already said all these words here and I will not say it again. Let me answer the question because I'm, I'm coming to the end soon, right? It's computationally efficient. I've already said all this, so I will not say it again, all right? So let me go through the numerical experiments before I talk. I answer the question, all right? The punchline of the numerical experiments is that uh, we do very well, right? We meet, the, we meet the lower bound, okay, in particular. 
So these are synthetic data sets. There are some real data sets in our paper, but they all convey the same message. So I'm not going to talk about the real data sets. So we have a K equals to four clusters, 11 items, a small instance, and D equals to three. So three dimensional mean vector. Okay, uh, so here is our uh, cluster vector. Okay, the first two items belong to the same cluster. The next four items belong to the next cluster and so on and so forth. And our mean vectors are as follows here. So the fourth mean vector here, okay, we designed in our paper to be easy, moderate, and challenging. Okay, why is this challenging? It's because this guy here is pretty close to mu one, right? It's the, the distance is only 0 0.5, but this is easy because it has a very large distance from everything else. It's a distance of five. So we call this easy, moderate, challenging, right? So, all right. So we can program this and we can run this. Okay, let's just focus on the moderate instance. There are too many plots here. Let's just focus on the moderate instance. And you can see um, where is our algorithm. Our algorithm is the one in uh, blue, but you cannot see the blue. This is the, our, our algorithm, which is BOC. All right. Then we have the lower bound here. And so you can see that our, our algorithm has the same gradient as the lower bound, which is uh, corroborating that it is asymptotically optimal. There can be an offset here, no problem. And uh, we compare our algorithm to Oracle. What is Oracle? Oracle means the Oracle proportion of armpuls is given to the algorithm. So as you can see, the, uh, our algorithm and Oracle sit on top of each other which means that our algorithm learns the Oracle proportional armpuls pretty quickly, okay? We also compare our algorithm, which is this line here, to uniform, okay? Just, this is just uniform uh, sampling. And you can see that not only, is the, not only is the stopping time much larger, but also the gradient is different. And the, the gradient is an indication of the hardness parameter because we, as, as what I've mentioned, okay, this, this is the... Uh, hard, hardness parameter D star, okay? As, as delta goes to zero. So the, the, this is the gradient, right? The gradient in this, in this plot here. Okay, so this basically tells us that our, our strategy is asymptotically optimal because it meets the lower bound in the sense of the gradient. All right, so this brings me to the end, okay? I don't have a concluding slide, all right? We have, uh, so we're setting up in a precise manner we have a bandit online clustering algorithm at each point in time. We basically sample, a, we basically choose an arm and we get a random variable associated to that arm. And based on our previous arm pools, we have to decide which arm to pull later. And we have to decide when to stop. And when we stop, we have to decide to output a certain partition that we pray and hope is the same as the original, the underlying partition. And we design an algorithm that achieves the fundamental limit. All right, thank you very much for listening and this is where I will stop. I'm happy to take questions, but there is one question in the chat which, yes, uh, Chao Tin, uh, there is a false exploration step in the algorithm that I didn't talk about. All right, uh, we need to force explore at the very beginning. I did not talk about that because I think that is a uh, standard to the bandit uh, community. This is the false exploration step. I, I went through this a bit too quickly, but hopefully this is not so important. Thank you for the question. I'm happy to take other questions in the chat or in, if you just unmute yourself. May I ask, nice a, follow up May I ask a follow up question? Yes. Yeah, based on my understanding, the actually for the original Gary Vias and the uh, Kaufman's paper, they have like a C tracking and D tracking. Yes. And uh, there's false exploration step in the, in the algorithm. And uh, my question is that like uh, the Oracle usually performs really bad. And in my opinion, it's the, it's the like the force exploration step make the RC tracking and D-tracking performs better. So okay. my question is that like in your, new, in your algorithm, is the force exploration or other components make your algorithm like efficient statistically? Statistically, okay, statistically it's hard to say because the false exploration does not really affect too much the, uh, uh, the, the performance of the algorithm. It may affect the performance of the algorithm empirically in terms of our experiments, but that we did not... 
Yes, sorry, I mean the empirical results, sorry. Yes, statistically, well, pretty, asymptotically, they are the same. Yeah, asymptotically are the same, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that. But um, maybe let me ask uh, if Jun Wen is still here, maybe I can ask him because, as you know, I didn't do the experiments, Jun Wen did. Does the false exploration step help in the empirical results? I don't know whether he's here or not. I saw him just now, but I think he's here. All right. Actually, I, I don't really have a, a good answer to this because uh, I, I suspect that the floss exploration really helps in the empirical experiments. Yeah, Chin Wen says that they are almost the same in, in his implementation. Maybe we can uh, discuss this uh, offline. They are, they are almost the same. You, you mean, um, Chin Wen, the Oracle and our algorithm are almost the same. May I ask a question? Yeah, sure, Saki. Hey, Vincent, thanks for a great talk. Uh, first, actually a comment as a fellow information theorist. You, you said uh, that the lower bounds you're familiar I'm with- sorry, are... Saki? Yes. Vincent said he was an information theorist. <laughs> <laughs> still, still, he still is, he still yeah. is. Uh, and uh, I, I'm wondering about, oh, so you, you talked about that change of measure as yes. the heart of all lower bounds. But yes. for you, I'd expect to also give, give some uh, respect to Fano type uh, arguments. <laughs> oh, Fano is a corollary of change of measure. Okay, okay. all right. Uh, <laughs> Fano is a, really a, a corollary. Okay, due to yeah. processing. I hear you. Um, so what I want to ask yeah. is about the, um, the, um robustness uh, of your your scheme like if if those new eyes are not exactly all the same um in in the oh. respective clusters mm. could you expect and hope but but you still want to get sort of the best clustering into however many m or k categories k categories think, yes uh, you think this same algorithm will still do well maybe even still be optimal in some sense? Optimal, I'm not sure. Empirically, I expect that our scheme should still be rather competitive. You know why? Because we allow for noise, all right? So if, the, if within the same cluster, the mean vectors are kind of, the mean vectors of several items are still kind of close, then the fact that we account for noise allows us to take into account slight discrepancies of the mean vectors within the same cluster. Okay. Now, of course, what I'm saying is rather heuristic and we need to try this out in practice, but I suppose that we was empirically, we will still perform pretty well, but we have no robustness guarantees here. Theoretical guarantees is difficult to say. I don't suppose that it's too difficult. Maybe we can still make some progress. So it feels like your analysis, this asymptotic thing is sort of a washing away, you know, these differences Saki is talking about if, if uh, arms are yeah. very similar, right, but not yeah. identical. Yeah. And um, um, it feels like there could be another kind of analysis on how well you're doing that doesn't sort of talk about getting exactly right asymptotically, but, but is ah, okay. more to the point of... Uh, you know, uh, doing well if things are similar. Yes, yes, yes. In information theory, as you, you have written several papers on this, in information theory, you call this, or we call this a rate distortion, right? So we allow for some distortion, say between what we output and the underlying uh, real cluster vector, we allow for some distortion, say we are okay with all distortions less than D. I'm sure we can do something. Right, if we are happy with uh, slight discrepancies. But do you feel like it'll be a totally different behavior in terms of the lower bound? No, in terms of the lower bound, I believe that we can write down a lower bound expression similarly to what we have written down, but the design of the algorithm will be much, will require much more thinking. The, the, the writing down of the lower bound may not be that challenging. Because we just but, have to think. But, but don't you feel like this could be like you could do way better? You could um, stop much 
more quickly. Yeah, yeah, we could stop much more quickly. Yes, we could stop much more quickly if uh, we have this uh, relaxed constraint here. Mm, the lower bound can be written down, but the design of the algorithm requires much rethinking. I think, yeah. All right, I guess if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you very much. And see you. Mm -hmm. See you, Lucky. Maybe I'll see you at ISIT or something. Bye bye. Take care, everybody.